He's the one that does the clothing. Yo, thank God we've got a pastor who prays the Lord. If I'm an overachiever, I begin to rock Elisha with the faith. gave the war of God. And, and be a man of God. And they would just, oh, I just want you set free. Christ from the dead lives no, in. No, that this preacher told you the truth. Suggest align yourself with CGIA and let's go forth and take our communities for Christ. Welcome to CGIA today. Changing lives through ministry signs and wonders is one part of what CGIA is doing across the North American continent through ministers and individuals that are proclaiming the word of the Lord. Stay tuned coming up on today's broadcast. There's a line that'll stand up for you. There's a lion that will fight for you. There's a lion that will roar for you. There's a lion that will defend you. Babylon can't stop you. The gates of hell won't prevail against you. You win in the end. Keep fighting. Keep preaching. Keep prophesying. Keep praying. Keep going. God's going to work a miracle on your behalf. Somebody give God praise. Stand up on your... My hand clap. Can we worship him for one moment? Give him a hand clap. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We thank you that you're here with us. Just go ahead and turn to your neighbor. Tell them this. Tell them you look like you've lost 20 pounds. Lie to them if you have to. Make them feel good about themselves. That's the first tip I can give you in growing a church. You want people to come back, tell them they look like they've lost weight, and they'll be back next week. So I think that's some good information at a church growth conference. Go ahead and turn to your other neighbor and tell them you're lucky you got to sit by me today. Just tell them that. They're lucky to be in your presence and uh, really lucky, and I don't believe in luck, but I'm pumped to get to preach and get to talk to you a little bit about growing churches. I love God's leaders. I love pastors. I love prophets. I love apostles. I love prophets. I love teachers, and I love the people that move the ball down the field because somebody's got to get up every morning at the gates of hell, make their coffee, look back across the enemy lines, and keep plugging, keep fighting no matter what happens, and you are those people. So I'm thankful for you, and it's an honor. I pray that God would encourage you. God to lift you. God would help you. God would take you down the road today. And uh, I just want to talk for a moment. I want to say, first of all, that, that I love you, Pastor Bob. Thank you so much for having me here. Your family's a blessing to me. This church is a blessing to me. And uh, we honor you. I remember him coming to ORU. Jesse and I were students at Oral Roberts University. And he would come and he'd preach and he'd prophesy and he'd call guys out and he'd read their mail. And I'd watch him and I'd say, man, I want to do that when I grow up. I want to, I want to be like that guy. And uh, he's influenced me. Uh, especially in the last couple of years. I, I knew way back then I was supposed to know you. I just knew I was, you know, I, I need to know that man. And uh, through the last couple of years, uh, I, I've got to meet him, and he's influenced and he's helped my life in the area of prayer and fasting. And I'm telling you, the anointings went up on our church, our ministry, the life, the spirit that there, it's just different because of your influence. Now, my Januaries are a lot more miserable than they used to be because of all that fasting at the first of the year. So we're a little mad at you about that, but uh, I'm thankful that the power went up. Somebody say amen to that. Here's what, here's what I, I want to preach today. I want to preach a message entitled, Your Ministry uh, Has Been Moved. Your ministry has been moved. And, and if you don't know who I, who I am, my wife, Jessie, she, uh, she spoke last night. I'm just here with her. That They love you, Jessie. They're still wondering about me right now, but they like you. And uh, tell you, I met Jessie in rehab in 1998. And uh, I, I was in rehab. Her daddy ran the rehab. She was the preacher's daughter. And the guy got me saved, got me filled with the Spirit, cast the devil out of me, got me discipled, got my mind renewed into paying back for everything he did for me. I ran off with his daughter. So we've been married 14 years now. I'll tell you what, the best rehabs in America have pretty girls in them. I wouldn't go to one with an ugly girl in the rehab. I, you know, I, I want the pretty girls there. So, so uh, uh, hon, thanks for coming and listening to me. She's heard this before. Uh, here's, what, here's what I want to preach. I want to talk to you about the fact that your ministry has been moved. I want to talk to American church leaders because this is where we live. This is where we are. Now, I don't know if you've noticed it yet or not, but the very fabric and foundation of America has radically changed in the last decade. And the America that our sons and daughters are being raised in is so different than the world that we were raised in. They look like daylight and dark. See, we were raised in a culture that was a lot more like Jerusalem. 
Think about Jerusalem. It's the city of God where the people of God is, where the temple of God is, where the word of God was preached, where it came in the old covenant. It's the symbol of everything that God was doing. And America was a Christian nation. We're believing God is going to get back and be a Christian nation again in America. We're fighting for America right now. I agree with you that America shall be saved and a third great awakening is coming to America. We believe that. We're praying for that. We're prophesying that. We're fasting for that. But right now when I look around America, cold Culturally, it's different. And, and think about this. Think about the Jewish boys that were raised in Jerusalem. Think about Daniel and his three friends. Think about those guys, the way they were brought up, what they saw, the way the culture smelled, the way the culture felt, what was in the air in Jerusalem. And in one day, Jerusalem was sacked. Babylon came upon them. It was a great turnover in their world, in their culture. Man, man they, they got deported somewhere else. They were taken to a place called Babylon. Now, Babylon in the Bible is a symbol of everything that's wicked, everything that's defiled, everything that's wrong, everything that's broken, everything that's hurting, everything that's destroying humanity. Daniel and his friends, they get up in Jerusalem and they're taken, they're deported to Babylon. Here's the catch with you and I. A lot of us were raised in a Jerusalem, but now we're living in Babylon and our address never changed. Our ministry's been moved, but our address didn't change. I send missionaries over to Southeast Asia. We're, we're involved safe homes for, for kids from the sex slave traffic deal, and, and we'll train them. We, we, got, we got people in our church have been saved, filled with the Spirit, and now they're over there living, giving their lives to help some kids get a better world, get Jesus, get the Bible, get all that. And, and we're trying to get them ready. Culturally, it's going to be different. Culturally, you're going to a different world. You're going to be around Burmese people. You're going to be around Thai people. It's going to be different. They're not like the folk in Owensboro. There is no moonlight barbecue, barbecue on the border of Burma. I'm telling you, it, it, it's a little bit different. And uh, so we culturally train them. But see, in America, a lot of us woke up and nobody ever trained us. Our nation shifted. We didn't pay attention. Now we're not living in Jerusalem. We're living in Babylon. So listen, we're in the world. We're not of the world. We're not to be isolated from the world, to be scared of the world, to get held up in little holy huddles and never walk outside of our tongue-talking circles. We're supposed to be out there in Babylon. We're supposed to get up in the morning walking in Babylon. Listen, I camp in Babylon. It's where I live. It's where I make my coffee. It's where I, I butter my bread. It's where I raise my children. We're in Babylon. We're there. We're not going to be isolated from Babylon because if we're isolated, they don't get one. See, we're to be isolated, excuse me, insulated not isolated. Somebody say insulated, not isolated. Let's say it again. Insulated, not isolated. If we're going to win in Babylon, we got to understand who we are. We need an insulation around us and we need to be in there making a difference. The first time I recognized that America had changed, it was probably 2001. I got saved in 1998. It was a free based meth amp junkie and an alcoholic. And Jesus saved me, got me saved, filled me, filled me with the Spirit, changed my life, and set me free. And I've been free for 16 years now. And you know what? I'm going to stay free. I'll be free 16 years down the road and 16 years after that because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen. Anybody else out there been set free from anything? Just lift a hand. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap for his freedom, for setting us free. Amen. So, so I, I've been free. And, uh, man, I came in, some charismatics rescued me. It's, it's what happened. And uh, I was so thankful for them. And, and I went to school at ORU. Jesse and I, we got hitched when we were preteens. And we moved off. And we went to, we went to college. And uh, I was working at a golf course. Only things I know is I know cattle. I was raiding the cat cattle business. I know about the golf industry, although I'm not very good at golf. I'm not scratch golf or anything. And I know a little bit about sheep, 10 years of pastoring. And I would be out there at that golf course, and uh, I worked with frat boys. I worked with the golf team. And so they'd want to play golf. They'd say, come on, Brian, let's go play golf. I'd say, yeah, I'd, I'd love to go with you. But if you're going to play golf with these guys, they play for money. So here's the game. They'd say, we come. Here's what it costs a hole. Here's what it costs a shot. And I'd say this to them. I'll tell you what I'll do with you. You put your money up. If you beat me, I'll pay up cash. If I beat you, you have to come to church 
with me. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I did it, and I'd still do it if I got the chance, because I'll do anything to win somebody. And I'll tell you what, you want to make putts you should have never made, you want to hit shots you should have never hit, you just get a pagan's rear on the line to get him to church, and the ball's going to start going in the hole. And uh, I would make these putts, I, I, I would do these things, and these boys would have to come to church. And they would come, and, and the, the, the pastor would get up and start preaching, the anointing would come on, they'd been out all night the night before, and their heads would just hang low. You see conviction coming on them and that kind of deal and, and and they started getting saved they started getting saved their lives started changing i became the pastor of the frat boys in the golf clubhouse that's what i was back then and when the stuff at the fan i was the guy they called but i took them to my church and i tried to keep them coming there now i would bring them to my church and after a while that they would come to me and they say brian i love you we love jesus we love the word of god but we don't understand your church it's different. It's, it's, and they're not talking about just the spiritual things we all, we all believe in. Come on, I'm a charismatic guy. You come to my church, you'll get filled with the Spirit. You'll get healed. You'll see words of knowledge. You'll see, you'll see charismatic manifestation. These guys were looking at something that they couldn't relate with culturally because the culture had moved somewhere else. But the church was left behind. Twenty-year-olds that wanted to go to church, they couldn't fit. So I'd take them over to another friends of my, a friend of mine who had a church in Tulsa. His church was spirit-filled, charismatic. You get filled with the spirit, you get healed, you get delivered there. Massive crusades, all that kind of thing. All the same doctrine, but the culture was different. And those young guys that go to that church and they'd stay. And they've been discipled, their lives have been changed, they're married and got kids now, and they're fit in the house of God. Listen, a lot of reason that our church is not growing. It's not a vision problem. Somebody say, it's not a vision problem. I agree with vision, vision's powerful. I'm with you 100% of the way. But most of you have a great vision in this house. We all got a great vision. We got great things we wanna do. Vision is everything. It's so big, it's so massive, it drives us. But listen, vision is what we see ourselves doing. But culture is what we do every day. And what we do every day will always trump our vision. And if the culture of your house doesn't look like something where the lost 20-year-old guy can walk in and connect to and plant his life in, root himself in there, put down deep roots, and get fed the word of God, we've got a culture problem. Culture eats vision for lunch. Y'all ever heard anybody say that? Sam Chan says it. Dr. Sam Chan all the time. Your culture will eat your vision for lunch. Vision's what I see myself doing, but culture is what I see my, uh, culture's what I do every day. I got a vision to weigh about 200 pounds. Right now you're looking at me and I weigh 250. Do you know why? My culture, what I eat every day, does not match my vision. And if I don't get that straight, I'm going to keep weighing 250. If I'm not careful, I'll weigh 260. And after that, 270. So come on, how many know our culture has to match our vision? Somebody say amen to that. Here's what Daniel had to do in Babylon. First thing he had to do is he had to learn the culture. He would train for three years in the ways of Babylon. The second thing we got to do when living in Babylon is when living in Babylon, we must guard our purity. Somebody say purity. First thing Babylon wants to do is it wants to defile us. King of Babylon brought all those Jewish boys and set out a spread that they were going to eat of. You're talking about the leader of the, of the whole world in its day. He lays out a spread. Tell me when the leader of the whole world lays out a spread that it isn't going to be something good, man. There was all kinds of stuff up there. There were lobster. There was pill and eat shrimp. There were crab legs. There were, there, there were pork chop sandwiches. Everything you could imagine. And they look at it, and the Bible says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Somebody lift a hand to heaven and say this. Say, I purpose in my heart that I won't let Babylon defile me. In Jesus' mighty name. Say it again. I purpose in my heart that I won't let Babylon defile me in Jesus' name. See, it's easier to get defiled in Babylon than it is in Jerusalem, isn't it? Because Babylon, the, the spirit's in the air. It's around you. It's different now in America. It's everywhere. You got porn in your pocket right now on your iPhone. 
It's easier to get defiled here than it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you had to go down under the bridge, meet some weirdo with something in a brown paper sack to get a porn mag. Now there's porn in your pocket. That's the way it is in Babylon. Our purpose must be higher to not defile ourselves further than ever before. Daniel said, I'm not going to defile myself. And he went and he talked to the master of, of the table, the master of their training. And he said, listen, we, we can't eat that. Can you do something? Can you, can you test us? Let us not eat that, but eat, eat vegetables and drink water for a period of days. And the guy said, I'll do it. But, but if, I, if, if you look bad, it'll cost me my head. So he said, test me. And after the testing time, Daniel and the boys tested better. Listen, we can't get defiled because the defiled man loses his prayer life. You ever notice that? Ministers, when we let our purity go, we lose our prayer life. After that, we lose our platform. The defiled man can't speak about the issues he used to speak about. The platform's gone. You ever seen the dad that blew it up in the house? How hard it is for him to correct the son or the daughter after that? The platform is gone. The defiled man loses the presence. And the presence is everything. Without the anointing, we have nothing. Somebody say amen to that. The third thing I see that we must have if we're going to live in Babylon is when living in Babylon, we've got to guard our integrity. It's just like purity to a certain extent, but integrity isn't just how we stand. I believe it's also how others view us. So what do they think about us? What do they, what do they see on our lives? Some people say, well, now I'm saved. Or ministers say, well, it's between me and Jesus what I do. And it's like, no, it's really not between you and Jesus only anymore. What you do. What I do is not just about me and Jesus. Because there's a lot of people looking at... Are you interested in becoming ordained through CGI this fall at the National Conference in Louisville, Kentucky? Visit CGIAmericas.org or call 502-964-3304, extension 1216 for more on how you can be credentialed through CGIA. In our midst. I've just been praying. We've been praying at the church. I said it earlier. We've been praying for 40 days. Every morning at 6 a.m. And we're church. You know, we're, 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 the people that will show up and pray with you are supernatural. They're awesome, aren't they? I mean, I'll take them. I'd love to have a thousand more of them. So, you know, we got a church Sunday morning. We're like a thousand people show up on Sunday morning. But, but this is one of my biggest, uh, one of the, the, the most exciting things about my church was is there's been 30 to, to 60 people showing up to pray every morning. If I can get 30 or 60 people to show up and pray at 6 a.m., I believe that I can change my city. If I get 100 people to show up and pray at 6 a.m., I think I could take my city. If I get 500 people to show up and pray, I think I could take my state. If I get 1,000 people to show up and pray, I think I could take my nation. If we get 10,000 somehow to show up and pray, I think we could take the world. Listen, God doesn't want to abdicate the world to Babylon. The world's his great love. It's the beauty of the gospel. He looks at the world and he says, it's what I've came for. It's what I'm after. The broken, the hurting, the messed up, the addict, the hooker, the pimp, the people that everybody else hates. Man, he loves her. So let's pray for Babylon. Instead of cursing Babylon, instead of shaking our fist at Babylon, instead of holding up signs about how nasty Babylon is, how about we pray for Babylon? How about we be a friend to Babylon? How about we bring a cup of water to Babylon, church? Are you thirsty, Babylon? Have a drink on me. And here's one for my homies right there, you know? It's like that. You gotta, gotta win Babylon. Prayer does it. So here's what happens. He, he prays in, in, in Babylon. And uh, he gets himself sentenced. You know the story. You've preached it. You're better preachers than I am. Gets himself sentenced to the lion's den. And he gets thrown into the lion's den. You know, all of us are going to get tossed in the lion's den at some time. Some of you are in the lion's den right now. You smell like lion's fur right now. When you walk, you, you can see it in people's eyes sometimes. They've been living in the lion's den recently. Maybe it's a lion's den of litigation. Maybe it's a lion's den of a lost kid. Maybe it's the lion's den of some kind of disease. Maybe it's a financial lion's den. Maybe it's a lion's den of lives in your mind, but lies in your mind. All of us are going to end up in the lion's den sometime. 
But I'm going to tell you, if we've been praying to the God who, who can rescue and ransom Babylon, Daniel got down in that lion's den. There's lions around him. Their teeth are showing. Their eyes are staring him down. He's smelling their fur. He hears their growl. That They're walking towards him. And I believe that right behind him, when the lions of Babylon came to trump him, that another lion stood up behind him that was greater than any lion of the lions of Babylon. It was the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. The lion of the tribe of Judah will stand up on your behalf if you'll lift your hands and pray to the God who wants to save Babylon. Come on, the lion's den isn't going to have you. Jesse and I, we've stared at, got reports in the past. They told me I had hep C once, which was a lie. Told me it might be cancer once, which was a lie. I've been up against demon-possessed uh, heads of planning and zoning, which they couldn't stop the church from going forward. I found out if we'll be somebody who'll pray, Man, when we get in that lion's den that our God will stand up on our behalf. You're not going to be lion bait. You're not going to be lion food. You're going to sleep with those lions. You're going to win. You're going to come out the next morning. See that presence that is with us. So powerful. It's so mighty. I remember getting a revelation of it years ago. We, we, we started our church, Jesse and I, was just two of us. God brought us a few people in Owensboro. We weren't from that city, didn't know anybody. And it was before there were good plans on planting churches. Now there's some guys got some good plans, and I'm thankful for their model. We, uh, we, we had a Bible, didn't have any money, didn't have anything like that. We, we, had, we had the Word of God, we had the Gospel, and we went and started preaching. We preach in a, in a pizza joint. And uh, in that pizza joint, I preached between a pool table and a jukebox. And they had metal, metal shows, heavy metal shows, uh, at this same pizza joint. And, and I had favor with the guys that, that owned it. And they would let me get up and preach to metal crowds. That, th those were my first disciples, kids at metal crowds. Now, I'd get up, I'd preach. They, they, would, they would set up between the bands. I'd get up and preach, and man, it was preaching to Babylon. You want to get sharper in your preaching? Preach at a heavy metal concert. I'd preach, and kids would scream, go to heck, we hate you. Now, I'm like, it trained me for being a local church pastor because people look at us like that all the time. They just don't say it, you know? And uh, they, they'd scream obscenities at me, and my buddies would be looking, wanting to kill them, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, you little punk, where's he at? Where's he at? Let's get him. And, and, but you know what, kids would... They get born again, they get saved. Eight, nine, 10, 12, get, get saved right there at a heavy metal concert. And I realize that even if, the, even if the environment seems against me, that's when the gospel's the most potent. When the environment seems against me, the gospel is always the most potent. You know where some of the most gospel hardened places I ever preach? I always give salvation altar calls at funerals. People call me, they want me to do a funeral. I'll say, I'll do a funeral for you. But here's what comes when I do a funeral. I give a salvation altar call. So if you don't want that at a funeral, you don't want me. And my town is half of a persuasion that, that they don't believe in the born-again experience. Not like, not like we believe it. It's evangelicals, charismatics, Pentecostals, Baptists, whatever you are. Uh, uh, not, not like that. And, and sometimes I'll preach at, at those funerals and I'll give people, I'll do it in a classy way because I want to honor the person whose life we're there to celebrate. But I'll give it, you've never felt greater opposition. Massive opposition, religious opposition. But I'm telling you what, when it feels like that, feels funky in the room. I like preaching when it's funky, don't you? It's like there's something weird in here. Let's plow through it. Let's just keep hitting it. Let's, let's just keep it going right now. I love the weird. The awkward's when the anointing starts to move for me. I've got an anointing for awkward. It's like, let's make it weird in here for a moment, and God will do something. And uh, when it gets like that, man, the gospel's so potent, so powerful. Chains break. You may feel like it's dying in here, but I'm telling you what, the gospel's never dead. It's always alive. It's always piercing. Why? Because there's something with us. There's a bigger lion with the man that loves Babylon and the God of Babylon. You know, we upgraded from that pizza joint years ago, and we got our play, ourselves a place real classy. It was a broken down bar downtown where the guy got popped for dealing uh, X and Coke out of it. And uh, so I thought, well, let's take a tavern and make it a tabernacle. And, and we were downtown. I, I like that idea. Let's, let's take a bar and make it a temple. And we, we were downtown. I went down there one Saturday night because I'd left my boots or I'd notes or something down there. And I was going to get my, I was going to get my stuff and uh, I'm, I'm walking over to my office, and it, was, it used to be a little rougher. Downtown Owensboro stepped up. We put a bunch of money into it now. But back then when we first started, like, I wouldn't let Jesse walk to the car by herself 
down there at night. It's kind of like I'm going to the car, hun, will you lay down some cover fire for me? You know, it felt like that down there at night just a little bit. And, and I, I'm getting out to go to my office, and I look, and there's a couple of dudes r- right up, about, about a half a block up, block up from me, and they're forcing a woman into a car. And, and, you know, no guy worth his salt. I'm not talking about a Christian man, just decent man walking around sucking air on two legs. Watches that happen and can live with himself. And I'm counting heads up there. How many men are there? Now, see, there's two of them. And I know I've been in some fights. I've won some. I've had the brakes beat off of me, too. And I know I'm outnumbered. And I'm walking up to it. And I'm like, well, I can take a beating with the best of them. Let's, let, let's do this. And, and I walk up and I say to these guys, I say, hey, guys, I, I don't know what's happening here. But I can't watch y'all just put this woman in this car. You're going to have to let her go. You're going to have to back off of her. You're going to have to, you're going to have to, when I said the one dude turned around, he pointed and he started coming at me. Listen, I was 50 pounds lighter back then. I was younger looking. It was, there was nothing intimidating about me at all. And he, he, he started walking and then he looked up at me and I swear his hands went up and he just backed up. And the two guys that could have done anything to me, they said, we're sorry, man. We'll get right out of your way. It was supernatural. What stood up for me? Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand clap. There's a lion that will stand up for you. There's a lion that will fight for you. There's a lion that will roar for you. There's a lion that will defend you. Babylon can't stop you. The gates of hell won't prevail against you. You win in the end. Keep fighting. Keep preaching. Keep prophesying. Keep praying. Keep going. God's going to work a miracle on your behalf. Somebody give God praise. Stand up on your feet. Somebody shout today if you believe it. We love you. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Let's really give him a praise. Let's really give him a praise. Let's really give him a praise. We love you, Lord. We believe you're doing something in our Babylon. Right now, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Just lift up a hand to heaven right now. I pray, Father, you'd quicken us. I pray you'd show us what we need to do. Show us the, the adjustments we need to make in our life, in our churches, in our spirit, in our, in our attitude, in my, my attitude. Lord, help me. I want to represent you like a Daniel in a broken, fallen world. Lord, put your hand on us. Put your hand on these leaders. Put your hand, it's already there, on the evangelists. Lord, we thank you for the anointing on their life. We thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you for their fasting. We thank you for what they've given, what they've sown. I believe that every seed's bringing a harvest, Father. I declare multiplication in churches. Right now, I declare your church is growing. 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 In the name of Jesus. Father, we believe we receive it. Churches of all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. Walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. I believe we can be multiplied in Babylon. Amen. Order today's sermon in its entirety by calling the number on the screen or visit cgiamericas.org for ordering information and to see today's program again. Order your copy of the CGIA 2014 Implantation Conference today online for only $30. It includes all the ministry and miracles of the CGIA National Conference from 2014 plus more. This is a limited time offer so visit CGIAmericas.org and order your copy on DVD today. Join us next week at the same time for CGIA today and stay connected with us online and on Facebook and Twitter.